Good evening, everybody. It has been a long day, and uh, this is the last panel. I hope you will have the energy to uh, bear with us and and um, uh, discuss a bit more about the commons and um, an economy of the commons. My name is Milan Kabulevic. I come from Croatia, and I'm an um, editorial board. Uh, member of Eurozine, and um, I also come from the field of culture, so this um, um, this discussion will, among other things, touch upon culture as well. Uh, so I will make a brief intro of uh, our speakers tonight. Uh, Alek Tarkovsky, to my right, uh, is the co-founder and director of Centrum Cifrove, did I pronounce it well? A think and do tank that builds tools and methodologies for using digital technologies to increase openness and civic engagement. He's also uh, the co-founder of Creative Commons Poland and an international um, uh, association supporting the digital public domain. Alec has a PhD in sociology from the Polish Academy of Science and MA in sociology from the University of Warsaw. Um, he, uh, for over a decade, he has been involved in studying and building a uh, digital society in Poland. Uh, his interests concern uh, social and cultural aspects of the ongoing di digital transition, with a particular focus on issues related to intellectual property and open models for production and distribution of knowledge. And this last part is quite important. Uh, on my left, uh, Christian Felber is an independent writer and speaker, as well as a lecturer. He teaches at Vienna University of Economics and Business. He's a co-founder of Attack Austria, the initiator of the economy for the common good. We will hear about it a bit later. And the project Back Bank for the Common Good. Christian uh, has authored several bestsellers, uh, among which Change Everything, Creating an Economy for the Common Good. And the other one is an um, award-winning book, Mon Money, the New Rules of the Game. He studied Spanish, psychology, sociology, and political sciences in Madrid and Vienna. And he's a commentator on ethics, business, and economics in various media. And he's a contemporary dancer. And I'm uh, extremely pleased that two of my um, uh, collectors tonight are uh, heavily engaged in the field of culture. So I will just give a brief outline of what we are going to talk to tonight and where we are coming from. So um, we will try to place this um, discussion uh, at the moment uh, where um, we as a um, society uh, in Europe um, face democratic deficits, a crisis of neoliberal model, a complexity of globalization and digital shift. And all these things um, uh, um, also affect the new models of organization of society and social functions. So uh, commons, I will just give a brief uh, definition of commons, uh, definition given by Bankler. Um, commons are a particular type of institutional arrangement for governing the use and disposition of resources. Uh, their salient uh, characteristic, uh, which defines them in contra uh, contradistinction to property, is that no single person has exclusive control over the use and disposition of any particular resource. Instead, resources governed by commons may be used or disposed of by anyone among some, uh, some number of persons under rules that may range from anything goes to quite articulated formal rules that are effectively enforced. So um, the reason why I chose this uh, definition of commons is that it tackles several key uh, words. One is the resources that we talked a lot about um, today. The other one is the institutional arrangement of government of governance or rules that are ex uh, extremely important and it was briefly touched uh, by um, Elizabeth in the previous panel, um, and then uh, no ex exclusive control, we talked about it, a community as opposed uh, to hierarchy, so horizontal ex um, as opposed to vertical. And um, so uh, without further ado, I will um, start with uh, Christian and ask you, um, so 
my background is Croatia, the Balkans, and uh, where I come from, democracy is very often directly linked to the free market um, since the 90s, of course, as opposed to old socialist one-party regime, which was politically corrupt. Uh, however, we found ourselves 25 years later in another in, uh, in um, kind of a deprivation through market forces, which leads to another uh, type of uh, direct political corruption. So we are back on the square one. Um, uh, we have very little poli political participation, especially on the part of the marginal groups. So. What I'm interested in is what is the relation between democracy and alternative economies based on the commons, if we can situate this discussion in this kind of broader frame. With pleasure. Hello, thanks for inviting me to this conversation. Um, I, as far as I'm informed, the twin sisterhood between capitalism and democracy or market economies and uh, democracy uh, has been divorced uh, over the last... 10 to 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, this is at least what I'm reading with one and another author, even from the Anglo-Saxon um, area. And it's more capitalism has become opposed to democracy and is not only eating up its own children, but it's eating up first and foremost democracy. That's mm -hmm. what we partly heard uh, from Ugo and other um, contributors. Um, in my worldview, the dichotomy uh, capitalism and communism is not so much not so much useful um, it's um, it's distraying um, our attention from a much more important dichotomy here on, on on one side there are capitalism and communism both characterized by extreme power concentration mm -hmm. just on the one hand public power concentration on the other hand private power concentration but both uh, based on power concentration and thus loss of liberty and democracy. And on the other side, there is a democratic society, uh, what I consider a truly liberal uh, society with diversity, with oikonomia instead of krematistike, which is the, the much better dichotomy. What's the difference between oikonomia and krematistike? <laughs> and with diversity amongst others in the types of property. And there we go. In the real existing um, socialism, which was not communism, but there was a, a focus on public uh, property. And, in, um, and in, the, in the real existing capitalism, there is an extreme uh, accent on private property. Um, and in an economy for the common good, there is the whole range of different and diverse types of property. There is private property, there is public property, and there is collective uh, property on a legal basis, like for instance cooperatives. Mm, there are legal, legal bodies, uh, but privately, collectively owned. There are commons which are partly on a non-legal basis, but privately and collectively owned. There are public goods, which is something different from just public property on a company. There is use uh, instead of property, as for instance with nature, which is a proposition, which is um, reality in some parts of the world but which is not the case in, you know, in, in the capitalistic countries. And there might be even the, uh, the, a, a right of nature that excludes humans even from the use and not only from the property. And these are six or seven uh, different types of property, um, which now are not paid uh, the same attention to, because if we look at what our governments are doing there, um, free trade and investment protection agreements are only focusing on private um, um, property, which is an extremism, uh, which uh, turns out in the end to be a totalitarianism. Um, and uh, the link between diversity with property and democracy is that this question, <laughs> the property question, always has to be answered and designed by the owners um, and in the democracy, as far as I understand it, the owners are uh, is this, the owner is the sovereign instance. At least uh, that is what the word sovereign literally means in Latin. Uh, it comes from the Latin word superanus and means literally to stand above all. Hmm? 
And uh, as far as I'm informed, there is no doubt that the sovereign instance in a democracy are the people. In a monarchy, the sovereign instance was the king or the queen or the emperor. But in democracy, it's the people. And property, property questions are, um, are uh, in the competence of, uh, of the people as a consequence, which today is not the case. Mm. But uh, today, um, the problem is more severe. Um, the fundamental questions of a democracy are not in the competence of the people. That's why uh, we put before an economy for the common good, or uh, as a fundament for an economy for the common good, we put uh, the idea of a sovereign democracy, which means that the sovereign instance uh, gets sovereign rights. Something, as far as I, I know, doesn't even exist in political science. From the, in the transition from monarchies to democracies, we got individual political, fundamental and human rights, which is a great, uh, a great thing that we obtained. But we did not think about, uh, as far as I know, and I studied political science, I did not even, even hear the concept of sovereign rights, which are collective democratic uh, rights, starting from the exclusive right to write, amend or change the constitution. In a sovereign democracy, this could be an exclusive right of the sovereign instance, the, the highest document could be exclusively written by the highest instance. This is something we don't know, just in very few exceptions. And then um, the very painful experience from Ugo, I, I still have uh, uh, the picture of your hand going to your heart, in my deepest, deepest, and luckily you said experience, huh? which I fully agree, the state is acting against the people, against the sovereign instance but it's hopefully not your conviction. Because if it was your conviction, then it could not change. But I am I'm proposing that this can change. And if the people write the constitution, then they can describe all these types of properties in the constitution with uh, acknowledging them, all types, acknowledging equally, huh? protecting them equally, then a trade agreement, just for instance, would treat all seven types of property and how the, uh, the trade agreement refers to all seven types of property. And last thought, um, um, ascribing both conditions and limitations to each of them that we cannot uh, turn into another extremism, nor capitalism, nor communism, just two very, um, two very last examples and that's it. Um, private property, fine, but <laughs> uh, companies have to do a common good balance sheet. And if the result is bad, they go into insolvency. And might it be ethical insolvency or in insufficiency in this case? Um, they are not allowed to become too big to fail or there is a maximum size. There was already the discussion yesterday that um, comp corporations became legal persons um, only in the 19th century um, in the United States. And in the, uh, still in the 19th century, in the United States, a, a corporation was forbidden to have property or ownership of a second corporation. Guess that. With the only argument that one corporation, one legal uh, person, would become too powerful if it also controlled the property of a second one. And compare that political analysis of corporations of the 19th century in the United States with uh, today's fact that Bayer is swallowing up Monsanto, mm. which has a global monopoly on, on certain markets for genetically modified organisms. And uh, being swallowed up by Bayer, it becomes an even more powerful monopoly if you look behind, the, the, the most important owners are the same. In both cases, the first owner is BlackRock. So when Monsanto is sold to buyer, BlackRock is selling Monsanto to BlackRock, if you look at the ownership structure. And uh, the same, so this would not be possible because there would be a maximum size for uh, private companies and maybe one private company is allowed to have property of uh, three to five other companies, but that's it. And but what you are talking about r right now is actually what I referred at the beginning are the uh, rules or mm. the, the governance. And uh, when we are talking, uh, you are now talking about different 
um, alternative economies, among in them uh, uh, traditional commons, but also other types of um, uh, economic models. What I'm uh, interested in uh, is the distribution of power that Ugo was talking about in uh, in the commons and uh, how does the, the the constitution written by the people that is happening now in Iceland or where it, uh, it was um, uh, an attempt. So uh, how does that um, uh, how is that governed? Yeah. So there is always the issue of governance, like how do we govern the complex processes with many people involved yeah. and how do we translate that into the economic field? Why, why I answered the second part of your question before the first part? Um, because uh, first is not sufficient. Huh? We have commons, we always have had commons and millions of commons, but then capitalism with with corporations that did not even exist 200 years ago, now have become more powerful. Still today, uh, we have um, many more cooperatives than transnational corporations, and the totality of all cooperatives give employment, full employment, to more persons than the wholeness of all 80,000 transnational corporations um, registered by the uh, Jungtat, and there are still more owners of cooperatives in the world than shareholders. Mm -hmm. But still, um, as or in this case already Mark said, uh, the, um, the, legal, uh, the legal situation is an outflow of the economic power relations. And that's why um, I, I would answer, of course, there are, there are very nice governance models and very democratic organization forms in commons, in cooperatives, in common good companies, maybe even in big corporations and social businesses. But this will never ever be enough and that's why the economy for the common good maybe at the first glance seems to be um, an association of companies that behave socially responsible and measure it and ask for legal benefits for mm. tax cuts and priority in public procurement and cheaper loans than corporations that behave anti-ethically but uh, in the background this is about a different um, economic order based on a, a, a deepened and reformed democracy that gives the power to the people as it's already contained in the concept of sovereignty. Thank you. Uh, Alec, you have been, uh, I, I introduced you as a, um, a co-founder of uh, Creative Commons in Poland and you, are, you have been involved with Digital Commons. Digital Shift uh, carried uh, a promise of abundance and, uh, but, uh, Scarcity was introduced at the beginning through copyright law or um, uh, integrated it in it. Uh, the digital community responded to that uh, by hacking the law and introducing different alternative license, licensing, um, Creative Commons, um, GNU, public, general public license, blah, blah, blah. Making, uh, and in, that, in doing so, it made a, a, an important stance for free and open content uh, as opposed to proprietary one. So my question would be, why is this so significant, especially in, in the context of what uh, Christian was talking about, and how does it affect relations between production, reproduction, and consumption? So you're right, I think there's a general interest in so-called digital commons, uh, because the question that this asks is, can it reinvigorate the, the whole idea of the commons and movements around it. Uh, it took some time. There were these ideas of, of new common goods. It, even for theorists, it took a while. But then Eleanor Ostrom, who studied that, got the, the Nobel Prize in economics. I think that was the moment when it was clear to everyone that we need to stop having discussions whether these are new commons or not. Um, it's interesting you used the quote by Jochai Benkler, who I think makes a very important point when you talk about digital commons. These are productive commons. Of course, very often, management of commons had to do with some form of production, and there is value in raw materials, and the classical pasture was productive. But I think the experience today, that, that's a very new experience. If you look at the typical commons project like Wikipedia or open source software, these are really huge content production um, projects. They can be seen in economic terms. This is sometimes done. There are studies where they calculate the value of Wikipedia or a big pile of software like Linux, and, and it is huge numbers. But I think that's less important because um, it, 
I don't think it's sufficient to try to bring the idea of a commons to an economic denominator. And we need to look at other values, which you know have traditionally been called externalities. And again, in economy, it took a while to consider them. But I don't think that their value is just should be measured in, in economic terms. And that's a debate anyone who follows the discussion about culture and development and economy knows pretty well. But I think the most interesting thing is that these are productive commons. So if you consider, for instance, Wikipedia as a social movement, which I know is not a, I think, popular idea, but please don't think for a second about it as an encyclopedia. Please think about people with a very broad sense of changing some status quo, then you can consider them as uh, a social movement. There means that their action form, their coll collective action is very unusual. They write encyclopedia, you know? Um, they're not protesting, uh, it's not the labor movement. I think it's something very new, uh, and it could only be done in a digital environment take, because of the specificity of digital content, right? The use, the, the low transaction costs. So I think this is the most um, interesting thing that, that this digital commons brings into this discussion. The question, of course, becomes how viable this is. I think we're at some turning point in general with regard to digital technologies, but since these technologies by now are ubiquitous and basically we're a technologized society, it's a question of a turning point for a certain moment for our societies. And I think basically we're at the point where, um, you know, recently, uh, this might sound like an anecdote, but uh, Associated Press decided the internet should be spelled with a small I and not a capital I. You know, the capital I was a, internet was a thing of wonder. It was a thing of social promise. 1996, uh, John Perry Barlow writes the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace and writes, oh, you weary giants of steel, you industrialized states, we are the civilization of the mind, leave us alone. You don't have a place here in cyberspace. 20 years pass uh, and the monopolies you mentioned that in general uh, are, are a trouble for our societies are clearly visible on the online space. So maybe we'll get back to it and um, but can talk whether really this um, new commons changes anything. One more point I want to make, I think one more part of economy that's very interesting is informal economy. So I agree cooperatives, very important form of the commons, but there is this you know, uh, idea of informal economy, sometimes called shadow economy. Uh, so basically the most simple example is the unpaid work of mothers, grandmothers, um, and children in the home. Uh, and I think this is another sphere we, where it uh, helps to think that that is a commons, that it is an experience of a commons, that there's a lot of sharing going there. Mm -hmm. It's maybe not the best thing to think of it in terms of um, paid for work that's unpaid. It's better to think that it's experience of, of collaboration. Mm. But now that you touched upon that and uh, something that digital um, environment uh, made uh, possible is sharing economy. You, you just mentioned that. And uh, this is kind of a... Uh, uh, now a controversy, we have Airbnb and Uber um, and... Do you allow uh, me to just yeah, a, yeah, a yeah, tiny... Just just a tiny amendment to the care economy. Huh? Mm -hmm. Today, care economy, in this case, as a consequence of sexual power relations, is mm -hmm. in the shadow, is uh, the most valuable work, because care um, work is the most valuable, which makes our relationships flourish and our, 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 our life good. Um, and this could be defined by the sovereign citizens if this could be a public good. Huh? And, and it's, for me, this is not a common, it's a public good, the care work. Um, can be children, can be the sick, can be the elderly, can be those who are dying, but it's care work. Um, and um, if we just um, accept society as it is, and then it's patriarchy, and it's mm -hmm. in the shadow and unpaid, um, and um, disvalued. But if we put it on the table of democratic uh, negotiation, then it might might turn into a, a public good, well paid, um, officially acknowledged, and part of the constitution. Okay, I, I have my opinion on that, but I will hold it for myself. Uh, but uh, uh, <laughs> welcome to the public goods. But uh, what I wanted to ask you uh, uh, before your interruption <laughs> is uh, sharing economy and uh, the evils of the sharing economy or the promises of the sharing economy. So when it started, it was this kind of also big thing we are sharing we are all self, uh, we can make money on driving our taxis and renting our uh, apartment uh, driving our cars and renting our apartments my uh, 
uh, question is, uh, first, it's uh, co-opted by capitalism. The, the whole notion of sharing is co-opted uh, and monetized. So, uh, um, so can we talk about sharing economy as we know it now uh, as, as a step towards um, economy of the commons? Or uh, can we talk about the difference between common property regimes and commons? Mm. Well, everything is captured by capitalism. Yeah. And never, how do we avoid that? It never, well, getting out of capitalism. It's the only way, the only way as uh, capitalism never sleeps. And as long as it is capitalism, it will capture and um, appropriate everything. That's, that's not a natural law, that's a systemic logic. No? And it will capture not only solidarity or empathy or emotional intelligence or consciousness, conscious capitalism, which I, uh, which I most love, everything, everything, spirituality, sexuality, everything, um, intimacy, everything. So the solution is get out of capitalism. And that's the core proposal of the economy for the common good. The main system should be changed in a way that um, the, the increase of capital measured in return on investment on the, on the micro level of an investment, the financial profit of a company on the meso level, and the GDP on the macro level of the national economy are no longer uh, the success measurement indicators uh, because as long as we measure economic success first and foremost with those three, ROI, profit and GDP, this is capitalism. And actually this is something which is against the constitution of most countries. Uh, many constitutions of uh, democratic countries say that the goal of the economy is the common good, the general welfare, the welfare of all. And no constitution says something differently. Uh, no constitution says that the overarching goal of uh, the economy is the increase of capital. And all constitution that tell us something about the role of capital say that it's a means. And uh, this uh, correction that capital uh, turns from the purpose, from the bottom line, from the goal, to the means and the common good becomes uh, the goal. This is, in, 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 in our view, absolutely decisive because uh, from then on we measure success in the economy with the uh, common good um, uh, contribution of an investment, with the common good contribution of a company, and with the common good product, uh, which already exists as a gross national happiness or better life index for the national economy. And we measure not only how solidarity a company is, but also how just the distribution, how sustainable its products and services, how human dignity is respected, and how democratical its organization. There we go to the governance model. And uh, solidarity is only one out of uh, a series of values which are equally important and all together compose the common good. And that's what the common good uh, balance sheet is measuring. Uh, just um, being solidary is not enough. Mm. Uh, we also look at uh, the property, democracy, distribution, all major, um, all uh, major parts of a of a company or a corporation. And according to the result of the common good balance sheet, uh, the company has a, an easier life or a, um, a more difficult life, um, which leads in case of irresponsibility and low um, scores in the ethical balance sheet to its insolvency. So this would really be a, a shift from the current uh, capitalism, which Aristotle already called krematistike, to the uh, oikonomia, in which the well-being of all members of the oikos of the household no matter if it's a smaller household of a human household or the major household of the whole planet, then ecological, is the, the highest goal, but not only as a lip service, <laughs> but as the bottom line, which is measured with, the, with, with these indicators. And according to the result of these indicators, uh, the, the company can uh, survive or uh, is going to die. So I think this is the definition that it's not capi capitalism anymore. Because the, def the, the easiest definition of capitalism is that the increase of capital is the final goal. Mm. Um, and if this is not po possible any anymore at the level of investments, at the level of a company, and at the level of a national economy, 
I think this is, of course, not the only step out of capitalism, but the first and most important step out of capitalism. Uh, you talked about the relation of the commons and the, and the <clears throat> private property, but uh, and earlier you mentioned the public goods. So I would be curious by uh, from both of you to hear, uh, what do you think the relation of the commons uh, is to the public goods? And, uh, and uh, what type of agent is uh, necessary uh, to to uh, build the commons um, in that respect. Shall I start? You want well, to start? Sure. So can I say just a bit about the monopolization? Because yeah. that's a sort of very interesting issue with, with the whole digital sphere today. And um, the, 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 the anecdote I mentioned about the small eye internet, I think it this moment feels like an end of a certain um, sh period, shift period or, or hybrid period where it was still in the open which way things will go. But basically things started turning in a way towards the worse if we're not happy about this capitalistic monopolization around 95. Uh, until 95, which is not well known, the major part of the internet at that time, which was the one governed by the US, uh, was by law non-commercial. This was written in the statute of, of the network management, which was done by non-commercial academic institutions. You couldn't conduct any commercial activity, no ads, simplest fact. You know, it was visibly non-commercial. It was a, a basically sphere of academic and intellectual um, uh, exchange of information. And, and this one shift is basically the one that opened the Pandora's box. Um, and in a way, you can have today a very bleak view, and it's telling that the, um, the founder of Creative Commons, uh, a movement to create this alternative intellectual property approach, um, decided at some point to shift his interests uh, to fight uh, what he sees as a form of corruption of politics in the US, which is corporate campaign financing. Um, this is a really telling story, I think. But at the same time, I think there still needs to be hope. Um, it's, it's in, though again, the, the vision is bleak. Almost any commercial service today, like Airbnb, which you mentioned, had a non commercial, so sort of pure produced commons uh, solution before that. For instance, couch surfing for couches. Uh, Airbnb had some, some alternatives or smaller ones. Um, and it seems. Um, in theory, in internet is a technology that was supposed to lower transaction costs so much. This is what Bankler believes, that you can have these non-corporate uh, production models or coordination models. In the end, it doesn't seem to work with the one sole example, and this is why uh, I want you to think that this what seems just to be an encyclopedia and a bunch of posts you always find at the top of your search results is really something significant. This is the only major example. It's a top page web, top 10 internet property. It's completely non-commercial. It's managed by a foundation with a pretty good commons model. You can argue some people think it's, it's by now a bit rotten, but in general it's, it's not bad. Uh, it, there are no ads and it refuses any, any form of commercialization despite pressure. So I think it, 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 it should give food for thought. Sure. Well, depends on each case. They coexist. They complement each other, and in the best case, they support each other. And that's why it's important to give them visibility, acknowledgement, and legal support. In the best case, in the, when, uh, I, I think what Ugo told us, and also what Elizabeth von Tatten told us, people try to um, protect and to define, to acknowledge, to protect their commons, but then the representatives of the people, which should be just their representatives, uh, they destroy uh, the, um, the, the efforts of, of the people. That's why I insist so much, um, at least in the idea of a sovereign democracy, although we are far from it, the idea um, um, is, is, uh, is, is the point of departure. And in Iceland, uh, they already made the first step, although they did not succeed, but they made the first step. And those um, abrogative referendums in Italy, they are something that already exists. So we, we have already departed and we can go one uh, further step every day. Um, if a private common or a public uh, good depends on each case, and we have, um, it's totally specific and it can switch from one to another. Um, example of water, in, um, it can be a, 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 a privately um, organized co uh, collective cooperative. We have 2,000 of them in Austria. And it can be a, muni a public municipal uh, service, uh, which we have uh, only 200 of in, 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 in Austria. 
the water itself, and that's very important, the water itself uh, should be not the property of anybody. The mm. water itself should be a holy good. Uh, it's, it's just the property of nature. Money, uh, a second thing, I, I think money now is created by commercial banks. So money is now a private good, which mm. is, uh, which is um, even in the monarchy, um, the, the right to issue money was a sovereign right of mm. the king. And now in a democracy, it's not a sovereign right anymore. It's it's uh, it's a public, um, uh, sorry, it's a uh, it's a private right of. It's not their right. It's a private practice because mm -hmm. the constitutions are are just silent about it. They don't define uh, the the creation uh, of money. But I I am wondering whether you can have uh, the. You were you were talking about Austria and the water management. Can you have both? So can you have public and a common uh, government um, in, a, in a kind of a hybrid uh, uh, type of, of governance where you have uh, organized, um, um, organized community on the one hand and uh, public um, authorities, so to say. That's called uh, public popular partnership. Public civil partnership is something or that we would public civil call. partnership, yeah. which I understand is the same, which exists in Brazil, in Malaysia, so in, in Austria. In, is that something that is kind of um, something that is uh, more robust uh, in terms of influence? Uh, is it uh, a structure that is in any way um, um, more beneficial? Um, when you when you combine the two, the cases I know, yes, clearly yes. Um, we, uh, I also wrote a book on um, privatization, and there was the same list of public-private partnerships are almost always uh, a failure for 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 the public. But the, the cases of public uh, civil partnerships or popular partnerships I know are always a big success. Maybe it's um, it's a best practice, but um, uh, even if there are many best practices in the public civil partnerships, in some cases, uh, um, uh, or by its, by its very logic, like the issuance of money of the official currency, um, uh, although it's a pub and it's become so differentiated, although it's a public good, uh, it should not be the state who controls this right. It should be the owner of the state, which are the sovereign citizens. They control the right, but then it's still a public good. And, um, and, and the stakeholders are anyway represented in the central bank uh, and in, in those who, who give the mandate to the central bank, uh, which are again the citizens who write the constitution. And in the constitution, they give the mandate to the central bank. And in the central bank, as a, as a concrete legal body, they're represented again, because we won't let in the, uh, as little as we will let the, the future economy to so-called economists, which are disguised crematists in, in most cases, we will not let the central bank's governance to bankers only, let alone to investment bankers, which is now the, the prevailing uh, tendency. Uh, let me remember, uh, uh, well, uh, the, maybe you all know the water supply of um, Porto Alegre in the south of Brazil. This is a best practice of public uh, civil uh, partnership and water sub, um, um, how do you say, coverage um, increased to 90% of the population, which is higher than uh, in, in many industrialized countries. And what is an absolutely um, modelic um, case is that the, the first quantity is for free, so all the poor can afford the water, which is a human right in the end. But the more you consume, the higher is the price. And that's the exact contrary of, uh, of the market model. In a market model, the more you consume um, electricity, energy, um, um, or water, the, the less you pay. Mm. Alec. <laughs> so, I, I was thinking what's for me a, a good example of either a dichotomy or a synergy between public goods and the commons, and I'll switch a bit the subject because for me the best example is cultural heritage. And now, I don't know, I can't read the room well enough whether 
you are the kind of people when we shift to culture, you're thinking, oh, that's good. It's very important to talk about it. Or you think, oh, that's a bit of this like insignificant issue because there are bigger problems. For me, culture is very important. And I appreciated the comment earlier that we're not just talking about works of art. We, we need a more general definition in which this particular part of culture fits. But there's a much bigger uh, stake here. And in general, culture for me is, for instance, this fear where we can practice the commons. So looking at heritage, it's a bit scary how much debates we need to have on heritage as a common good, as commons, uh, because seen as a public issue, it's actually not necessarily shared. There's a very strong tradition of, of sort of public administration of culture where you treat it as works that need to be, I know, archived, protected, uh, managed. And um, sort of into this whole discussion, I think, again, digital technologies arrived as sort of a source of very new affordances uh, that, uh, that disrupted, to some extent, certain, for instance, hierarchies uh, around cultural institutions. And they suddenly are becoming aware this is still a process where there are uh, quite sustainable ways of managing uh, cultural heritage um, as a commons. Copyright, again, here uh, reappears as sort of a monster where we need to have uh, debates whether movies, which are basically soon, uh, the, the film will fall apart. Uh, they have no commercial value anymore. Uh, they're clearly important pieces of heritage, and we need to have a discussion whether they should be freely available through a technology which basically really lowers whatever you want, access costs, costs, reuse costs, a uh, chance to produce new creative works. Um, so I think this is a sphere where, where optimally, again, we would have some sort of public civic partnership, but, but we're not yet there, which, which I think is a Yeah, pity. we have uh, Google uh, digitizing books. Uh, yes, and that's another thing. There is, of course, an economic aspect there, uh, and it turns to, to be the, the winning solution that if you can provide that little bit of funding needed, uh, at the large sort of view, this is not extreme amounts of money, although the institutions don't have them, that becomes the winning solution. And as Christine mentioned, this moves to a public-private partnerships with all its risks. Yeah. Can I ask a, mm -hmm. a last question? I just have a picture of a, of a mosaic of uh, property types with the example of Creative Commons and um, our computers. <laughs> so the internet, uh, in, in my ideal world, would be a global public good. So um, for free access of everybody. And, um, the the computer, the hardware, uh, can be product of um, or uh, cooperatives or um, social companies. That one that existed in the ex Yugoslavia, or at least some kind of big corporations or co bigger major companies that do a common good balance sheet. Um, this, the operative system, I use Linux, um, and the software generally um, could be um, open source, creative or... open source and creative commons. And the energy <laughs> that yeah. I use is uh, that kind of uh, locally democratized uh, common, can be private, can be public, there I'm, I'm, I'm neutral, yeah. but should not, of course, not be from an olig oligopolistic capitali capitalistic a uh, big corporation. How about... If I can add to that... I, I, I think I, I we can close the panel. We have the... If we look at it like some sort of a ladder or a stack, I'm interested in the topmost elements, and I see there are two things. I see there applications, social networks, basically, the, 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 we can call it some sort of public space online. Um, and there, I think it's a, it's a fascinating discussion whether you can, for instance, have Facebook alternative as a public good. It, it seems like a... For instance, Evgeny Morozov makes this argument sometimes, but I think even he sees it as utterly utopian argument he can make in the column. But then sometimes uh, utopias do come into life. <laughs> And for instance, there's a debate whether Twitter, a popular social network, which now is in a bit of a strange um, economic situation, there are really realistic arguments made that it could be bought out by um, um, soft uh, engineers working in the company and the public. The Facebook mm -hmm. is by definition a natural monopoly. Mm. And natural monopolies, by definition, have to be public. And this is the, the free choice that companies in the economy for the common good would have. As soon as they pass a certain threshold of market share, they are democratized, of course, progressively, but um, as soon as they have 30, uh, third or, or 50 percent, they are 100 percent public, of course, and then have a free choice because they can freely choose to keep growing and become democratized or keep small 
um, no danger for our <laughs> private lives and uh, and self determination um, uh, because we still, uh, but have to remain small. But you need they, you're saying they need to be. I understand what you mean. I also agree with this word need, but is it, is it a realistic? thought that they will be, because one other thing I would add there to remember is that there's one type of other immaterial good that's really important, and that's data about us. Mm. And that's another crucial debate today, mm. uh, not yet unsolved and with a bit bleak prospects. Um, and it's not an easy answer, how do you manage private data? But, but surely not with the way we are seeing, and we need to understand, you when you mentioned, for instance, Monsanto, I really think you know, data about Facebook, I think it's by now 1.5 billion people regularly being regulated, basically, by, by a single uh, entity with algorithmic power, uh, mm. just enforcing certain rules, uh, institutional rules, values, uh, very sort of strange and a bit scary. I don't have a quick answer either, but um, <laughs> what, what my proposition is, and that's also the answer, what is need, uh, I'm tot I'm, I trust and I'm totally confident that if, if people uh, wrote the rules, of Facebook, then the rules will be totally different from the rules that Facebook is imposing on us. Well, uh, that was actually my last question. <laughs> what should be done? And <laughs> that's why I said uh, I have to close down the panel now. We have all the answers, but uh, I'm sure that we have a lot of questions as well. So I'll open the floor for the questions. Uh, can we make a round of uh, five questions and then um, answer them all together? Uh, so there's one, there is, Ugo is here one, and there is, yeah, four questions, okay. Uh, hello. Um, we are talking about internet as a, um, as, a, as a right, as a human right. People should be able to access the internet. Um, in Greece, but not only in Greece, uh, it's actually all around Europe, there are rural areas which are cut off. They don't have any internet connectivity whatsoever. Um, I'm involved in a project where we deploy a Wi-Fi community network to provide local inhabitants and visitors of 14 villages with internet connectivity, open access. Um, and um, this is something that we have done without the support of uh, uh, public authorities or the state whatsoever. It's a genuinely grassroots movement. Um, what we uh, are, a, a big challenge that we are facing is uh, this. Uh, when you deploy a local um, community network, this has to be connected to the internet. This has to provide access to the, to the whole pool of knowledge uh, that, that's out there. In this sense, it's kind, it kind of reverses the challenge that the common goods are posing, uh, so to say the uh, tragedy of the commons. So if you have a, a, a lake filled with fish, then who is the owner of, of, this, public, of this common good and who can use it? And uh, this, uh, this is challenging because this is a finite uh, source, a resource. Whereas, uh, when you're talking about a, a, a digital networks, its actual value increases as these networks connect to each other. Um, so, um, uh, this is, um, uh, there is a, there is a, the question here is, um, how does this relate to the to the problem to the, to the to the question of uh, uh, how to uh, increase the, or uh, produce value by uh, uh, by uh, utilizing such a such a common uh, resource. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. Well, collect David, uh, Ugo, and there was a one hand there. Ah. Okay. Thanks. Um, I wonder how you deal with this sticky questions connected to intellectual uh, ownership. You know, for example, uh, the music industry, right? Music industry has become less commodified as the uh, 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 works, songs become more widely available. Um, on the other hand, you know, it has the consequence of uh, the people being less able to produce it, right? Uh, 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 musicians 
not being able to survive that way. Band friends tell me, you know, you have to play concerts to survive, right? That, uh, uh, and so, on the one hand, it becomes more widely available, uh, which we might see as a good thing, more present in the commons. On the other hand, it, uh, you know, has the consequence of uh, reducing the number of people who are able to produce it. Uh, then you have something very different like Academia EDU, right? Which is, um, widely available, uh, not commodified. I mean, I know there are some ideas that maybe they'll privatize it sometime in the future or, you know, uh, 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 make it available for a fee, but right now it's not. Uh, those articles uh, are able to be posted more widely because academics, and it partly depends on country, I know, and depends on type of employment, but uh, many of them, if not most of them, get paid by their university, right, by their institute, uh, and then put this online so they don't, right, that can be more widely spread uh, for free without hurting the production aspect. But in music, it's just very different. And I, I, I just, you know, so, so I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, how do you address those? Like, like you know, I, I see a particularly uh, problem in the music industry. Uh, I, I was just uh, wondering, can you pass the mic up to... So, yeah, and Ugo, can uh, it's uh, well, uh, it's 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 a nice follow up for what was just said. It seems to me that there is something that has to be clarified very very clearly that being a common doesn't mean being free. You know, when we say water is a common and we should run water as a common, it doesn't mean that we should have access to water for free. It means that you should use ecological ideas in the running of water, that is to say, consuming as little water as possible, as a rule of thumb, okay? And therefore, if you have a company that runs a product that then doesn't want to sell it because it should be reduced, the governance of water cannot be, the governance of a common in general cannot be the same governance of a capitalist institution that tries to sell as much as possible. So similarly, when we talk about uh, starving artists, this is actually a serious problem because uh, it seems to me that the evolution that went on, and this is probably something very, very recent and that we should actually start thinking about, and it seems to me that it is the product of Internet 2.0. That is to say, the degree of self-exploitation that is actually happening and the degree of willingness of the people to become not just a consumer. You know, the, the, there was a, it, it's now well studied the fact that from citizenship, we passed through consumers. So the citizen became a consumer uh, through a complex thing, but now you know, the political spectacle is basically consumed, right? We are passive consumers of the political spectacle in the capitalist institutional setting, but now the consumer is becoming himself the, 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 the commodity. In other words, we are not just consumers anymore, we are ourselves the commodity, and the way in which they advertise our own commodification is by telling us that this is for free. But in fact, it is not for free at all. It is that we are, whenever something is for free, it's become you became the commodity. So we are kind of working hard, you know, to feed all this data into uh, Facebook, into Twitter, into, you know, academia.ed, whatever you want, which is a way to give out and give away data about ourselves that then feed the algorithms of the big serving uh, clouds, which are not like some imaginary thing. It's not that the internet works like that. The internet is a hugely and in intensive energy consuming machinery with a huge structure of centralized power in those huge computer machines that stay somewhere in Northern California or in the desert of Nevada that are so powerful that even make hot the rivers. So there is a whole narrative of this sort of diffusion of power that per se is given by the internet. But if we go to look at the structure of corporations such as uh, Facebook or Twitter, especially Facebook, we find in things like, for example, in the board of, of, of Facebook there are the Department of, uh, of Defense, the American Department of Defense, the CIA. So there are the public structure that are already merging into this structure. So we are kind of, we need uh, some more sophisticated tools of analyzing this stuff, it seems to me. Uh, thank you. And, uh, okay, um, I'm gonna 
make a brief question. I was very happy to hear you two talk about the care economy, uh, but I was uh, very puzzled by when you said that you wished for care to become some kind of public good. I really, I, I can understand, I really understand how patriarchal exploitation happens when it comes to this, but I do not understand how this would be a public good if we use the mainstream economic definition of, of a public good, which I think you have been doing. So I would like to hear some more about that. Who will begin? Well, then I start, um, more or less in the same sequence. Um, rural areas and internet. Um, if the public good worked, uh, then there uh, would be the mandate of universal coverage, and you would not need to fill in any hole. No? As, the, as there is no um, public good, uh, which is uh, internet access, cheap internet access, or free internet access for everybody everywhere, even in the most remote valley, uh, then the people have to uh, subsidiarily um, build their local commons, which is just uh, um, the description of, uh, of reality. But I think, uh, I, I think it's extremely smart and um, solidary and creative what you're doing, but I, I think we could uh, use this creativity and solidarity for, um, for, um, for a more comfortable life quality than um, doing the the basic things, which is the internet or the telephone, which really should, could be, in my uh, eyes, a public good. Mm. About the music, uh, maybe you can say something about the music. I'm not an expert in music. I, I thought a lot about patents. No? And um, following the Dutch example uh, in the Netherlands, the, the patent law was introduced in, in the beginning of the 19th century and it was abolished again in the end of the 19th century because they realized that it's just an artificial monopoly. <laughs> and then in the, in the, in the, uh, for some parts, in only in the late 20th century, they reintroduced it. Um, the, the proposal of the economy for the common good is that there is no patent protection by law. Um, and the balance sheet, in the balance sheet, measures if you share what you discover and if that what you discover is penetrating market, um, you're getting rewarded it. So that the more it penetrates markets, is used by others, it's shared by others, um, the better is your uh, balance sheet result. It's just uh, one thought. Um, internet, just a, a tiny um, comment on your comment. Um, if internet was a public good, the rules, not only of Facebook, but also of how we organize internet, could be made more democratically. And what is really a common is um, a method of decision making, which is called systemic consensus. Um, and maybe you don't know it, I really, really recommend it. Um, it is a method that um, everybody who has a voice in a decision making process can make a proposal. And um, all proposals are voted on, but uh, what is measured is the resistance against every proposal. And the winner is that proposal that meets the least resistance. And in this procedure, no power, no cooperation, cooperation uh, has ever, uh, ever a chance of, uh, of being the winner. And uh, the result would be, is uh, um, increasing uh, creativity, because people would think over less bad and even and less bad and even less bad solution for that problem. And the first thing is okay, let's um, design a systems of DC decentral providers, and maybe you cannot even choose your provider because it's part of the public infrastructure, and you're automatically um, ascribed to a provider. Which is, but which is democratically controlled by the people and not by a, a state authority. And um, yeah, the, the care work as a public good. Um, let's let's see how how is it. I see two, um, um, and also trying to um, to understand feminist theories. I see two two main um, schools. First school is. Um, capitalism already capitalized everything, so let's not capitalize um, care economy. And uh, <laughs> friends of mine say not, it's not reproduction of life, it's production of life. So actually, um, uh, it's not a, a distinction between 
productive and reproductive uh, activities, but actually it's a distinction between productive uh, activities, which is child uh, bearing uh, and life creating, and um, remunerated activities, <laughs> which m might even be destructive. Uh, first, school says um, let's not capitalize, monetize, um, let's demonetize everything else. Um, I think it's a good it's a good idea, but I don't see the way to demonetizing today everything else. I, I just don't see the pragmatic proposal how to do it. So uh, as for the next step, I think the which is which can be done is to um, remunerate care work um, um, in accordance to human dignity. Of course, with rules that uh, these works have to be shared equally by men and women or by all genders and not be done exclusively by women. Maybe that's, it, that's not the best solution, but between all solutions that are at, at hand at the moment, I think it's the less bad uh, solution. But don't be afraid. This is just my personal opinion. But what I demand is not that my personal opinion uh, shall be implemented. What I demand is that if uh, that who, who decides what is a public good and if care work shall become a public good is us. So we can decide that it shall not become a public good. And only if we decide that it shall become a public good, then we define the rules, the conditions, and everything else. Thank you, Alec. Your... Could I? Uh, yeah, yeah, of I'm course. I'm sorry, this is no, maybe just... unpolite. So I come from Sweden. I'm not afraid <laughs> at all for these questions. And we have time. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. But I mean, that is about how you can make some things public services, which we have. I actually think that the the publicly financed or at least heavily subsidized, about 90% of, of childcare in Sweden is, is subsidized by taxes and so on. I, I think that is great social innovations, but I consider a public good to be something else. And that is what I didn't understand. Don't we say that, you know, a public good is a product that one individual can consume without reducing its availability to another individual and from which no one is excluded. And I just don't understand that. That was my question, really. Let's call it a public service in order to not create further confusion and not consume more time even, because there is still something to say about it, but I renounce. Thank you for the comment about grassroots internet connectivity. I think mesh networks are a, a, a long-standing feature of the internet that sort of needs to be uh, hold, held on to, despite the fact that it's another sphere where we're sort of losing the game and the, the public institutions have forfeited, basically. So today, connectivity in places without such connectivity is basically ensured by big companies who see an interest in providing connectivity so they later provide their services. There's a service which has a very sort of confusing and bland name called Free Basics, which is a Facebook service in, in places like India and Africa, where they provide internet access but only to a certain range of services and pages, which is their own plus a range of things they provide as some sort of uh, corporate, um, uh, they would probably call it the form of uh, civic responsibility. In India, it was a, a subject of a huge social backlash, and basically uh, the, the civil society forced the government to reject this project. In Africa, it's accepted as a solution, so we can see that there are different approaches to it, but basically this is a moment where, so to say, some people don't know they're on the internet. You know. They think it doesn't exist, they don't know about it, which is another sign that a certain period is ending and we might at some point see this sort of open public internet as a certain historic occurrence, which would be, I think, very sad. But that's why it's important, even if it's 14 villages, I think, to keep it as a template of a, of a different solution, you know, which is grassroots and civic. With regard to intellectual property, it's such a big subject, I don't think we can uh, untangle it. The crucial argument is, is, is the one that, yes, the commons doesn't, exclude payments and I think this was a lesson that took some part for the commons to learn because initially I guess we were just enamored by this idea you know, that information wants to be free and there were just the floodgates opened and the content just flooded us. Creative Commons itself took content creation as a given. We are interested in how to share content without really asking for a long time how it's produced. There's a certain genius, in my opinion, to a project started by an organization that's part of the ECF uh, Commons project, which is Goteo. 
uh, by a group called Platonic, uh, who said we need to start with the initial issue, which is funding. And I think this was really very brilliant insight about the commons and start this whole thinking about what are sustainable models because there needs to be funding, which doesn't mean that there are also uh, places, so to say, in the commons which can be free. So again, Wikipedia, I'm sorry, I'm kind of, I guess, fascinated by it, is a sphere and a huge one where somehow these people are willing to function in non-reimbursed, uh, non-monetary model and it, and it works. But this doesn't mean others shouldn't. So, and again, I think everywhere in music and academia, it's important to know that there are now sort of blueprints for solutions that are sustainable also towards the creators. The question is whether we can scale them against models that are maybe less fair or sustainable with science. That was actually something I wanted to mention earlier, but because like heritage, it's another sphere where one can just wonder why we're not yet in a position which sort of would be ideal that provided that there is funding, this is really knowledge freely shared. And it's sort of a, um, a paradox. I'm not going to ask people to raise hands whether they use a service called Sci-Hub which is an utterly pirate, illegal service that breaks copyright of all scientific publishers and for this reason is based in Kazakhstan. And its founder, who's not some kind of a pirate or a mafia person, but is a lady with a PhD, I think, in biology, cannot basically leave her country because she would probably get arrested at the gate when she would land in Europe. Um, you know, th this, this is sort of the paradox that it has to be illegal in order to provide uh, free access um, to, to knowledge. Uh, we're living in a society where people get basically arrested in certain countries for sharing knowledge. And, and the response to that is, well, because money needs to be made. But the thing is, there are solutions. There's a whole sphere of open access which basically figured it out. Uh, they have sustainable models for making sort of the budget meet. Only you need to sort of flip to new solution. They're even doing it in some spheres like theoretical physics. I think it's, it's discussion. We have these templates for sort of two worlds, and now it's a scaling issue. Um, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> okay. Uh, do we have any more questions or comments? Well, you have been wonderful, and you too have been wonderful, and I'm thanking you all, uh, especially to Alec and Christian, and uh, I'm uh, inviting you for the dinner. <laughs> what can I say? It has been a long day, and uh, we will see you um, in the morning for the next round of panels. Thank you very much.